So in the words of Bell Hooks, uh, she says our society is an imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patri patriarchy. I would, I would include uh, that we're at where we live in an imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, ableist, cisnormative, heteropatriarchy. Um, and society is structured by these systems. Um, so it is all of these things at once, thereby creating unique experiences of oppression on groups who exist across different <laughs> marginal identities. Uh, this creates what we then um, normalize um, and how we experience the world, including... Uh, sorry, can I just ask that we mute our mic? Thank you. Um, this creates what we normalize and how we experience the world, uh, including any benefits that you might accrue um, based on identities that um, fit into this structure um, or any penalties based on identities that exist outside of this structure. Um, and so um, intersectionality is a term um, that has been coined um, um, to unpack the complexity of a multidimensional experience of, of oppression. Um, and it is critical to apply this lens and this understanding of intersectionality throughout this presentation and beyond, particularly when committed to um, practicing anti-oppression and anti-racism. So I'm going to share that now. What is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a way of understanding Can you add the captions? Oh, good. What is Never intersectionality? Mind. Intersectionality is a way of understanding social relations by examining intersecting forms of discrimination. This means acknowledging that social systems are complicated and that many forms of oppression, like racism, sexism, and ageism, might be present and active at the same time in a person's life. Everyday approaches to building equality tend to focus on one type of discrimination, for instance, sexism, and then work to address only that specific concern. But while the career of a young, white, and able-bodied woman might improve with gender equality protections, an older, black, disabled lesbian may continue to be hampered by racism, ageism, ableism, and homophobia in the workplace. Intersectionality is about understanding and addressing all potential roadblocks to an individual or group's well-being. But it's not as simple as just adding up oppressions and addressing each one individually. Racism, sexism, and ableism exist on their own, but when combined, they compound and transform the experience of oppression. Intersectionality acknowledges that unique oppressions exist, but is also dedicated to understanding how they change in combination. The roots of intersectionality lie within the Black feminist movement, with legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw originating the term. Crenshaw felt that anti-racist and feminist movements were both overlooking the unique challenges faced by black women. She stated that legislation about race is framed to protect black men and legislation about sexism is understood to protect white women. So simply combining racism and sexism together does not therefore protect black women. Intersectional theory is now applied across a range of social divisions and also to understandings of domination, such as those associated with whiteness, masculinity, and heterosexuality. Intersectionality is not only about multiple identities, and it's not a simple answer to solving problems around equality and diversity. It is, however, an essential framework as we truly engage with issues around privilege and power and work to bring them into the open. Intersectionality means listening to others, examining our own privileges, and asking questions about who may be excluded or adversely affected by our work. As importantly, it means taking measurable action to invite, include, and center the voices and work of marginalized individuals.
Okay. So that video on intersectionality, that definition, I think uh, the reason why I added it in this um, presentation is because I think it is done really, really well. Um, and it uh, connects uh, quite well with um, being able to apply this framework to what we will be talking about today. Um, and going back to this idea about what the structure of our society is, that really long um, definition of it being imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, ableist, cisnormative, heteropatriarchy, um, using intersectionality as a framework to understand what we're talking about is essential. So what is art? Art is also really important in terms of understanding to frame the conversation um, that we're talking about this afternoon, this morning. Um, and I thought that it would be really um, essential to break that down so that we can apply anti-oppression theories um, to a sector and to work that, um, that exists within that structure of our society. So art essentially is cultural production um, and involves an interaction of values, ideas, and organizational practices shaped by established social and historical conditions. And so this is really important, the fact that this cultural production that we engage in um, through the arts, um, but also in terms of the university sector, um, um, thinking, noting that, it, that this knowledge this work is established by the social and historical conditions. Um, right. So as I said, I'm going to use my personal story to guide um, the flow um, and, and the frame of this presentation today. Um, as in my introduction, as Tracy mentioned, um, I'm a proud black woman. Um, but to come to this um, understanding of who I am um, wasn't something, wasn't an af afterthought or something that I just ended up figuring out that I was. Um, it was, it was something that was quite um, present in my life um, from the earliest than, than I can re that I can remember, and feeling a difference um, and a lack of belonging. And so I was born in the UK and I lived there until I was five years old um, and, and given the pervasiveness of how cen central um, whiteness or white culture is in the UK and was it in the UK at the time that led to a series of um, experiences that I had um, and and you know also at the age of five and probably earlier than that um, feeling real having an identity crisis, essentially. Um, my parents fortunately noticed what was going on um, and decided to make the move back to their home country of St. Lucia, um, where I lived for um, five years of my life, so from age five to 10. Um, and that island is a predominantly Black um, island, which still has, is still shaped by um, whiteness because of the colonial legacies and racism and so on and so forth. However, because it was a predominantly Black environment, um, the, the weight that I was carrying around um, on in terms of um, identity crisis kind of evaporated as soon as I was in St. Lucia, as soon as I, I, I landed, essentially. Um, um, from there, at the age of 10, my parents made the decision to immigrate to Canada. Um, and I lived in uh, Scarborough, which is in the GTA. Um, and, you know, I think at that point, I had confidence in who I was and what my abilities were um, in terms of school and, and, and what my interests were in terms of, of things that I would do outside of school. Um, however, um, it was a move to university um, in Kingston. So I went to Queen's University as an, for my undergrad degree uh, where I, where my understanding of racism was turned on its head. Um, it was something that I never expected <laughs> that I would experience in that way. I knew racism was a thing and that it existed, uh, but the way that it seems to manifest, particularly in Kingston, is um, 
is, is quite um, visceral and intense. Um, and so that was an eye-opening experience for me and kind of led me down a journey in terms of really interrogating how racism functions um, and why it can look different in different, um, in different cities um, and in, in places like Canada where um, the, the, the dominant narrative is Canada is a multicultural um, place and therefore um, racism is not a thing or it's not as bad as the USA. Um, for example. Um, I want to also say that, you know, for me growing up or um, being, being a person in, in community, I think being involved in the community is really essential. Um, and so I position myself towards more collective, collectivized living um, frameworks. Um, as opposed to being an individual and hoarding wealth and, you know, um, only doing things that would benefit me. Um, and being a person who experiences racism, experiences sexism and, and other types of oppression, um, it puts in, in, in really deep perspective for me uh, the fact of, of how, you know, individual individualism is part of the problem. Um, and so coming back to Kingston, um, often I, I get asked the question, I, I, I left Kingston, I finished my undergrad and I, I went to uh, back to the UK, surprise, surprise, the place where I had my, um, uh, my identity crises, but I went back to the UK um, because I was looking for a language to be able to um, discuss and understand exactly how racism had functioned. And that was something that I was un unable to find in Canada at the time. Um, and through my um, postgraduate education, um, just thinking about myself and, and trying to um, get involved and try new things, um, I came across um, aerial arts or circus arts um, that the university had partnered with the local, um, the local studio to give lessons and classes and so on. And I thought, you know, that was something that I've never done before. Um, and it's not something that you necessarily really see black people doing at all. Um, and so fully expecting that it was gonna be a very white space, um, I decided to try my hand um, at it. And, and, and today I still continue. I'm really glad to be part of the Kingston Arts um, the Kingston Circus Arts Center's performance team. I, I really enjoy doing um, aerial um, and learning and engaging my brain in a different way um, than I do in my typical day-to-day -day life, which would be working at the university in a role around anti-racism. And so I am constantly talking about anti-racism. I'm constantly thinking about it. I am constantly talking about it. And so um, practicing the, the form, the art form of Ariel and learning it really um, is a little bit of a, a break um, from using my brain to constantly think about anti-racism. Though it is important and it, it, I bring all of that with me when I enter those, those spaces. And so <clears throat> I think this is very much connected to, and when I'm thinking about myself um, in the arts, um, I think about the historical uh, legacies and what has happened in the past and how blackness is viewed. Uh, because inevitably in, in performance spaces, you're, for me anyhow, you, you're, you're putting yourself on show. Um, and my blackness is not an aspect of myself that I can choose not to share. I wear this identity 24 seven, even on days when I'm tired of asking, answering questions about, um, about what resources people should read, for example. Um, and so I start with, and I think about um, Sarah Bartman, um, who was known um, derogatorily um, as hot and hot Venus. Um, and, and Bartman was taken from South Africa, um, her home at the age of 21 years old and shipped to London um, where she would be, where she was caged um, and exhibited as a freak show. Um, she was presented semi-nude, her physique, especially her large 
buttocks was the source of much curios curiosity, but as her fame spread, um, so did her exploitation. Um, and so Sarah Bartman is one of, represents the way that Black women, um, it's an early representation of how Black women were exoticized or are exoticized and fetishized, um, but also treated in a very spectacle way. Um, and so sometimes when I think about myself being in a performance space, those are, those are the things that I'm thinking um, and or at least airing my subconscious um, and have to negotiate um, when I make decisions to put myself in certain situations. So Sarah, for, um, her story is sometimes used as a symbol to illustrate a various social and political strains. And through these applications, her true story, unfortunately, has become lost. Um, Dr. Yvette Abram, um, who is a professor of women and gender studies at the University of the Western Cape, says that we lack academic studies that view Sarah Bartman as anything other than a symbol. Her story becomes marginalized as it is always used to illustrate some other topic. Um, and so for some reason, um, Sarah Bartman is always employed to represent African discrimination and suffering in the West. Um, and so even here, I'm using <laughs> her story or what we know of her story to represent that. Um, but there were many other um, people from her uh, village um, called the Khoi Khoi people who were taken from their, um, from South Africa and brought to Europe. For example, a historian called Neil Parsons says that writes about two Khoi Khoi children of ages 13 and six who were taken from South Africa and displayed at a holiday fair in Germany in 1845. Um, there has been a traveling show called the Boydemans tra that traveled around Britain, um, Ireland and France consisting of two men, women, one woman and a baby. Um, and the circus was in business from 1846 to 1855. Um, there was a show called Little People advertised as with a 16 year old girl by the name of Flora as the missing link and acquired six more Khoi Khoi children after her. These were just some of the cases of Khoi Khoi Africans who were enslaved and put on display. Um, the reason why Bartman's tale is so famous uh, may be that she was the first Khoi Khoi to be taken from her homeland. However, it is most likely that her fame is due to the extensive exploitation of her body by the general public and scientists, as well as the horrible mistreatment she received during her life and after her death. Um, she was brought to the West solely on the premise of her exaggerated female form and the European public gained a sickening obsession with her reproductive organs. And we know this is to be true of other Black uh, women, Black slaves who um, were, who were, were um, tested on or experimented on um, before gynecology became um, a medical discipline. And they were exper experimented on without any anesthetic. Um, her body parts, Sarah Bartman's, um, were on display at the Musée de la Homme um, for 150 years, and her story as a symbol may be due to the awareness and the sympathy has, it has evoked in the public eye. And so even though Bartman was the first Khoi Khoi to land in Europe, much of her story has been lost, um, and she instead is defined by her tragic utilization and exploitation in the West. Um, and I think um, like thinking, saying this out loud, um, there is a really um, infamous individual called Alfie Pierce um, in Kingston that uh, gets talked a lot about um, at Queens. And I think that there have been many narratives. He's a, a Black um, individual who, who lived most of his life on Queens campus. Um, and a lot of um, stories and um, inferences have been placed on his life um, um, that obscures what his actual reality was. And so just even looking at the way that um, individuals' existence are used to um, build narratives or to um, uh, or to, to make a point, um, even the, their story in itself, the fact that it is lost is a really, um, 
a really com well for me i feel like it's a complex feeling because um their true their true humanity is sort of taken out of that and they then become the product of of making a point um but that moves us on to thinking about minstrels um and i've attached um gollywog there as well um because the picture that you see is a gollywog that also would look like what a minstrel would be dressed like um but in by 1848, blackface minstrel shows were a national art form in North America um, and translating formal art such as opera into popular terms for general audiences. Um, and so each show uh, consisted of com comic skits, variety acts, dancing and music performances that depicted people specifically of African descent. Uh, the shows were performed by mostly white people in makeup or blackface for the purpose of playing the role of Black people. There were also some African-American performers and Black-only minstrel groups that formed and toured. And so um, in Brighton, UK, um, there are quite a few stories about American Black minstrel performers who found um, work, um, who found employment um, by touring their minstrel shows. Um, and so the minstrel shows um, sh showed black people or, or focused on black people being dim-witted, lazy, buffoonish, um, superstitious, and happy-go-lucky. And so you, we really start to see how the stereotypes that um, are placed on black uh, life and, and black populations today um, are very much attached to these early um, these early demonstrations or, or replication of, um, of blackness as entertainment. <clears throat> and, and that's all you know, blackness is, is good for, either to be part of the economy um, as you know, doing slave work or, or being the economy, I guess, and then as entertainment, which is also part of the economy, at least right now, it's, it's a huge part of the economy. Um, and so the minstrels kind of um, acts died down towards the end of the 19th century, which is 1890s. Um, but we see the rise of Gollywogs, um, which is a, a doll-like character um, created by Florence Kate Upton um, that appeared in children's books in the, the late 19th century, um, usually depicted as a type of rag doll and popular well into the 1880s. Um, wog, the, the term itself is a slang word um, of, um, in the idiom of British English, and it's usually um, employed as an ethnic or racial slur and considered derogatory and offensive. Um, and so connected to that, many nursery rhymes are vestiges of racist songs, for example, um, and nursery rhymes that we still have today um, that have had their lyrics changed, but were espousing and again, reproducing these narratives around um, whiteness being superior. Um, the last person that I, I like to think about or, or I want to share around entertainment, Josephine Baker, her narrative does, it does not necessarily, um, it's not used as a demonstration of how, um, of how blackness was was consumed and is consumed and the expectation that of the expectations or the stereotypes that are put on on blackness as they were for the minstrels um, and for Sarah Bartman. Um, and Baker, Josephine Baker performed as the last dancer on the end of chorus lines um, where her act was to perform in a comic manner. So reminiscent of minstrels um, and um, she was essentially the pony. So the, the member of the chorus who couldn't remember the dance until the encore, at which, at which some point um, she would be able to perform it uh, correctly, but also with more complexity. And so connecting that to the minstrels, it's like this idea of being you know, dim-witted or lazy um, and then um, showing up and, and then entertaining everyone because you've, you've shocked them um, out of that. Um, her career began with blackface comedy um, at local clubs in the U.S. Uh, and this was entertainment uh, of 
which her mother had disapproved. So her mother didn't really like that she was doing this. However, these performances landed Baker opportunities to travel the world, to get paid. Um, her family lived in um, severe poverty um, and it was by playing into what white culture wanted from blackness, from her, is the way that she was able to access success. So in Paris, she became an instant success for her erotic dancing and for appearing practically nude on stage. Baker performed the dance Savage, wearing a costume consisting of a skirt made of a string of artificial bananas. So very much um, like what the, the picture or the illustration that you see on the slide on the screen. Her success coincided around um, in 1925 with the exposition Des Arts de, uh, directly um, the Exposition des Arts, um, which gave birth to the term Art Deco, um, and also with a renewal of interest in non-Western forms of art, including African forms of art. So Baker represented one aspect of this fashion, um, and in later shows in Paris, she was often accompanied on stage by her pet cheetah, Chiquita, who was adorned with a diamond collar. Um, the cheetah frequently escaped into the orchestra pit where it terrorized, up, terrorized the musicians, adding another element of excitement to the show. So again, it's a lot about um, what can we consume of blackness. Oh, she's, she's so exotic. She, she also has a pet cheetah. So all black people must um, have a, a, a pet cheetah. Um, so she, um, though her story isn't necessarily connected to uh, or used to make the connection between um, anti-Black racism and, and um, society, um, she was heavily involved in the civil rights movements in the 1950s. Um, and so, for example, she went to visit New York at one point with her husband, and she was refused reservations at 36 hotels because of racial discrimination. Um, and she was so upset by this treatment that she wrote articles about the segregation in the United States. She had refused to perform for segregated audiences in the US. Um, and her, um, her insistence on mixed audiences helped integrate live entertainment shows in La Las Vegas, N N Nevada. So she was greatly loved by the arist aristocracy of Europe, but that was in a kind of, I, I guess we're seeing the, the start of, of um, of, uh, you're, you're, we're seeing the start of tokenization, really. Um, one, one Black person is good enough. Um, and so for reference, um, the trans transatlantic slave trade was abolished in 1807 in Europe. Um, and in 1834, um, through the Commonwealth of, of Britain, so Canada, and in 1865 in the US. And so, throughout that timeline, Josephine actually um, falls outside of the abolishment of slavery, but we see the legacies of how Sarah Bartman was paraded around and used as, as, um, as an instrument to gawk at and to be amazed by um, minstrels, you know, creating these stereotypes to attach to blackness and then also right having having a tokenized experience of what blackness is um, and 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 consuming that and and using that as entertainment um, today uh, I, if we're connecting it to today blackness is only accepted when it can be consumed and used as entertainment. And so when, when you think about um, really popular Black people, um, they are often in like the music industry or in athletics um, and these, and really are sit um, side by side with the, pen the penetration of a commodity culture. Um, and so capitalism really driving um, driving the desire for more of this, um, but and 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 keeping um, keeping uh, black keeping black individuals in spaces where they can experience real success or huge success um, on the scale of capitalism in in areas where that blackness. Um, is utilized as, as a way to consume for, for white culture. 
Um, and so we can start to think about cultural appropriation, which only further reinforces the continuation and normalization of white supremacy. Um, and, and we're gonna um, explore cultural appropriation a little bit further on. Um, but as one example, when, when I'm talking about when, when we show up, when Black people show up in places where we're not expected to be, um, so for example, if we think about Simone Biles and her extreme success um, in gymnastics, um, you, there, there is a, almost an immediate backlash um, and exclusion that happens to Black people in, in those spaces. And so that's something for myself that I'm often quite conscious about um, in being in the art space, but in particular in terms of circus, given you know the his, the historical legacy of of Sarah Bartman or, or the, the part of her story that we know about. So connecting that to the circus, um, I did a little bit of reading um, before the session um, around the history of circus performances, um, and I read that you know it really started off with horses um, and and horses going around the track. So circus. Uh, translates to circle. Um, and over time, it evolved to include um, animals like elephants and, and, and exotic um, um, cats, so like tigers and, and lions, um, and people and acrobats started getting involved and, and clowns and so on and so forth. Um, and so um, there is a, a close association of like a freak show and zoos being incorporated into um, the success or into the equation of a of the formula of a, of a circus. Uh, and so many of you may be familiar with the term run away with the circus. Um, let's run away with the circus where many there are many misfits um, in, who are not accepted or excluded from mainstream society uh, and they can find a community um, to be together um, and to live essentially um, together. And so for me, again, thinking about my own entry point into arts or circus arts in particular, um, I think that this concept of running away with the circus um, to be a quite a radical one in that um, this idea of rejecting um, the mainstream and dominant assertions of what um, a community looks like and who belongs and who doesn't. Um, and I think it's also closely like the idea of the concept of the circus is closely linked to travelers um, or who are better known as the Romani peoples um, of Europe. Um, and so if you think about the fortune telling or the, the caravans that are associated sometimes with circuses, um, um, Romani peoples who have experienced a, um, a historical legacy of exclusion from, um, from dominant society and are continued to be distinctly discriminated against and persecuted by the dominant society in Europe and the United States. Um, find space and, and own the space as a circle as, as their own. And so they have the freedom to put out to the world what it is um, that they want to, or and they're, they're existing. Um, and I think for Black people to exist sometimes, and more, most, more often than not, it takes a lot of time and energy to simply exist. Um, and so I think the circus or the idea of the circus and, and more broadly the arts has the potential to create a distinct space for black, for black performers and artists, a distinct community that sits outside of the mainstream white society. So again, we come back to this um, idea around or this question around what do we mean by art? What is cultural production? Um, and so art really is, you know, music, theater, literature, film, print, broadcast, um, and now includes social media and with the rise of influencers. Um, and what the arts do is it provides society with a sense of what it means to be, for example, a man or a woman, poor or rich, indigenous or black. Um, and cultural production is the lens through which people view themselves and the world. Um, the arts or cultural production communicates powerful messages about core values, about the norms, the cultural hierarchies, and the central narratives of mainstream society. So cultural products and practices, the arts in short, tend to mirror social realities. Um, and cultural production provides a vehicle through which dominant cultural ideologies 
are promoted, sustained, and reinforced. Uh, and so it's really important to note that these dominant cultural ideologies, these beliefs appear invisible and natural to those who are immersed in it. Um, and which is why sometimes it's really hard to have that conversation around anti-racism or for example, being in Canada and having that narrative of multiculturalism that you hear, uh, it's, it's essentially indoctrinated in, in the minds of people. Um, and so it is really hard <laughs> to see um, what Robin D'Angelo calls the racial waters that we're that we're constantly in, that we're swimming in. Um, so cultural practices like art um, cannot be removed from the environment which they find expression. The environment, the context is really important. All forms of cultural production must be understood in the context of how they were produced, by whom, at what historical moment and with what social, economic, and political impact. So art can, we know, um, art can be, as I mentioned, really radical art spaces, um, and it can challenge the status quo, it can form new social relations, and it can be a form of political and social resistance. And that is really exciting about art. Artistic production is an important source and site of struggle against the dominant culture, um, significantly influenced by its legacy of European uh, Eurocentric heritage. Um, art can push boundaries of what is accepted and normative in society at any one time, um, such that art challenges the status quo by creating new forms of expression or reinventing old ones. Art is, as a form of resistance, has been coined by um, theory, theorists um, calling it avant-gardism, um, which values nonconformist ideology of new ideas and eagerness to shape new traditions and throw away the outdated past. Artistic and cultural production stand at the forefront of radical social change in society. And therefore, we find most advances in inclusion of racialized or and other marginalized artists and their communities in the sector in, in, in art. Um, and so it can go a long way. The space tends to be, or the structure of the space, the, imag the fact that we have to be imaginative um, opens up a, a, quite a few avenues to push anti-racism, anti-oppressive work um, further. Um, and often is on the forefront of these changes um, in society, since it reflects um, what the what the the dominant narratives um, and understandings of society are. So, for example, um, Afrofuturism is one such form of art um, that pushes boundaries and reimagines re and goes against the status quo. Um, Afrofuturism takes representations of uh, lived realities of Black people in the past um, and the present and re-examines the narratives to attempt to build new truths outside the dominant cultural narrative. So again, if we're thinking back to Sarah Bartman, to the minstrels, to the gollywogs, um, and even um, to uh, Josephine Baker, um, we're tr we, Afrofuturism is building these new truths outside of the dominant cultural narrative, which would have been um, um, articulated through, those, through that history of those individuals um, and those forms of art. Um, but also continue to be articulated in popular press and in the media. So Afrofuturism analyzes the ways in which um, alienation has occurred um, for Black populations. Afrofuturism works to connect with the African diaspora with its histories and knowledge of racialized bodies. It is not restricted to any single medium. So on the screen, you can see the artwork for Erica Badu's um, um, album. Um, and so it can be music. Uh, there's a lot of literature around Afrofuturism. Um, there are movies or film um, that demonstrate there are prints and phot photography. And I imagine that, you know, doing this presentation and putting it together, I really thought long and hard that this is potentially something um, that uh, I could do uh, if I want, if I so chose to um, in and incorporate in my in my aerial practice. 
So Afrofuturism involves reclaiming some type of agency over one story, a story that has been told throughout much of history by the dominant culture in the name of white supremacy. And so I find that really, really empowering and powerful in itself, this idea that I'm reclaiming or we have the ability to reclaim our story and tell it the way that we would imagine that we would like it to be. Um, in 2018, I had the um, um, I had the uh, privilege of being able to attend the Decolonize conference in Toronto that was held that is held annually by OISE, um, which is the um, education department at U of T. And one of the keynote speakers was Gloria Ladson Billings, who was a professor or a professor of hip hop at an American university. And she was in discussion or she was talking about Afrofuturism and made the um, the observation that uh, for white society, the general everyday reality is not a dystopia. And so we see this reflected um, in terms of pushing boundaries in their art, in art, in popular mainstream. And so if we think about things like dystopian, like Handmaid's Tale um, and, and, and other um, books that are based on, on crime and so on and so forth, um, it becomes a source of entertainment because for the, the mainstream white society, this is, this is unimaginable um, that this, would, this could happen or would be allowed to happen um, for them. On, conversely, she made the, the observation that for black folks, um, because we live such a dystopian reality um, all of the time, um, we are drawn to creating art of utopias to counter what it is that we live. And so our Afrofuturism is really part of that work. So I've been talking for a really long time. Um, and typically in my workshops, I like to get people involved um, talking, given that we're on uh, online, um, having small discussions isn't the easiest or the most appropriate. Um, and so I wanted to propose that we take five minutes um, to think about or to, to, to get out um, an idea um, of art for cultural transformation. So take about five minutes to complete a rough outline or a sketch of any form of art that you are involved in or you would like to explore that would push the boundaries of the status quo in your local community. Um, and I have some uh, prompt here uh, that will help, hopefully help um, in terms of getting that idea out and massaging that idea um, of art as being a form of resistance or a form of your resistance to, to the status quo. Um, and the first thing that you would want to maybe think about is, you know, what is your identity? Um, how do you fit into the structure? Um, of society? How do you fit into the status quo and how do you not? Um, you might also want to think about what is the context of your community historically and contemporarily? Um, what has gone on? What continues to go on? Um, think about how, think about the how. Um, what is your medium um, and how does that medium counter the mundane or that e the everyday, the things that we don't, we do without thinking because it's so normalized? Um, why are you doing it? So what's the desired social, economic and political impact of that art? Um, and you know, what, the, what is the message? That's really, that's really important. What does it offer the community? Um, and if it has a why, it should definitely have a message. It has a what. And then when, um, how does the public access this knowledge and resistance? And that's a really key part as well. So in summary, this exercise is really designed or hopefully designed to help you push boundaries and thinking of ways to subvert the systems of power in society. Um, here we're moving into the territory of anti-racism and anti-oppression because we are seeking to actively counter those social constructs uh, that govern the status quo. So uh, let's take about five minutes to do that. Um, and just so you have a heads up, there will be a five minutes break as well. So 10 minutes, start working on it you know, get up, stretch your leg. If Sometimes I do my best thinking by stretching um, or by moving around. 
um, try do please do try to get it down on paper um, or down somewhere uh, so that you can refer to it um, at, a, a, at another point in, in this presentation. So yeah, let's be let's come back for I'll start talking again at uh, 1210. Thank you. You're muted, Tracy. Thank you. I said thanks so much, Lavi, and everyone enjoy your break.
Hello. So it is 12, 11, 11 minutes past 12. Um, so I'm just going to get right back in. So let me make sure that we're, we're staying on time and on cue. And then that way I don't have to skip anything. Um, and so hopefully that break was relaxing um, and it was good to stretch um, and do get some water if that's what you needed. Um, but also, I guess, maybe some of you were also working on um, the uh, activity of um, constructing some art as, as a form of resistance, as resistance. Um, <clears throat> and so I think to continue on from where, to pick up where I left off, um, it's important to note to, 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 it's exciting that work coming from the margins that marginalized populations inhabit challenges the existing norms of society by producing work that is critical of the status quo in an attempt to stimulate um, social transformation. There is, however, unfortunately, <laughs> the um, insidious, I guess, side of that. Or if we think about our society, remember, we live in a, um, we live in a, an imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, ableist, cis-normative cis heteropatriarchy. And so this, these structure, structures are quite strong and resilient. Um, and so when there is the, the opportunities and um, to create um, and stimulate social transformation, uh, we've seen with cultural reproduction, which we know is, is necessary to maintaining um, the structure of society um, as it is um, and, has it, and as it has been designed, um, it can then be co-opted for, for capitalism um, and stripped of its, its transforming powers um, once we start commodifying um, art um, and placing that commodity value on, on, on our art rather than um, its transforming um, ability of, of stimulating social change. Um, and so that is very much connected to um, cultural appropriation. So the, the, the cloud with the lightning bolt, um, and maybe it could even be a brain, but I, 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 I visualized it as a cloud. Um, and the lightning bolt, think of, of the story of Frankenstein, where, you know, you have, you're creating this amazing um, thing that has um, a great, or, or work that has um, huge potential. And then you have the, the lightning bolt that brings it to life um, and it gets co-opted or it, you, it's, you've created a monster. Um, and so the phenomenon of, of appropriation is, is that monster, um, is that, the, the structure um, of our society really bouncing back and saying and 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 reinforcing its position as as this is what society looks like and this is how we operate. So the ph phenomenon of appropriation for commercial gain uh, re usually results in profits for the appropriators rather than for the original creator. So it's very much connect to capital um, and capital production. And so we know that avant-gardism or um, art as resistance can be co-opted by the establishment, um, by the establishment in complicity with modern capitalism, and therefore this then neutralizes its transforming powers, uh, leading to um, which is now the familiar dynamic of cultural appropriation, um, because it's grounded in the purpose of commodification. <clears throat> So um, how does racism manifest in, 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 in the arts and cultural pr production? That's a question that we, we, need, we should be considering and, and really do need to consider. And so a lot of when I was doing my background research and, and trying to get my thoughts together for this presentation, um, the book that I have listed at the bottom of the, the slide that says Source, Henry and Tate, The Color of Democracy, Racism in Canadian Society, uh, really, um, is a great resource in summarizing um, how um, racism operates in Canada. It's, it's a huge textbook. Um, there was a particular chapter on the arts, which is what I referred to most mostly. Um, 
And it does a brilliant job, again, as, as of summarizing um, how racism shows up. And so the few ways that um, it listed in, in, in that textbook, um, it, it lists eight, is the dominance of white Anglo-European culture. Um, when we talk about the dominant culture in Canada, what we're talking about um, is white Canada, white European culture. Um, and so there is the, um, the like things like European hairstyles, European religions, Euro European um, ways of, of, of engaging and knowing become the norm. And this is what is expected of people. Otherwise you are um, cast aside, you are marginalized. Um, and so that leads into point two where um, we have the dominance of this white Anglo-European culture. And then therefore we see in the arts an inferiorization, essentialization and marginalization of other cultures. And essentialization is a big one that does happen um, because often people say, well, that's representation, but it really is constraining um, other cultures outside of white culture um, or European culture to be this one thing um, and, not, and never really expanding beyond that. Um, we see the invisibility of images, narratives, and voices of racialized people. Um, and so, you know, I, I was saying I'm, I'm relatively new to um, the world of aerial and circus arts. Um, and to my knowledge, there aren't many Black women um, or men who who exist um, who exist in 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 that field um, professionally. Um, there's also the cultural appropriation of stories, images, and ideas of racialized and indigenous people. So sometimes it's you know connected again to that capital. How do we make this so that it's um, it has mass appeal that we can consume, we can get as much out of it as possible, as much money out of it as possible to, to fund, again, white, that the dominance of white Anglo-European culture. Um, you can think about the lack of racialized representation on boards, arts, councils, unions, and professional organizations. Um, this is really key. Um, often um, people, think about the lack of representation um, on the stage or in front of the camera, but it is not just who is in front of the camera, but also who is behind it, according to Steve McQueen, who is a black direct, uh, a, a black, a British black director. Um, it, it is, it is important to include um, black voices, racialized voices, indigenous voices in the areas of cultural production that make the decisions, um, that have the agency and the power um, to dictate what, what, um, what that cultural production will look like, what messaging is going to put full, uh, is going to be supported. Um, we can think about the lack of access to funding, um, Eurocentric aesthetic values. That's a, a big one for me um, that I often, again, think about in terms of performances um, and thinking about for me, particularly connected to like my hair. Um, and as an example, there's a, a show on Netflix called She's Gotta Have It. Um, and the actress Dewanda Wise, um, the lead, she, um, was on a podcast recently and was talking about, you know, showing up to set with her hair pre-done because by her own hairstylist, because the hairstylists on set don't know what to do and how to do it. And when they do do it, it's just like a really horrible job where now this, this person who is putting, essentially being quite vulnerable um, and putting themselves out there, the, the, the making of art is quite vulnerable um, to me. A vulnerable work. Um, she is no longer there. You, you're not. No, you're no longer feeling comfortable in your own skin, feeling confident about the way that you look, and so on. And and dealing with that pressure, trying to that additional pressure, and also trying to perform and perform twice as well. Otherwise, you'll never get booked again. Um, and, and the final thing as well is, again, negative images and stereotyping, which, you know, sometimes typecasts individuals um, into, like, they will only get work um, if they're playing in, 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 the, in, in reference to Black actors or um, um, 
artists playing drug dealers and so on and so forth. So constantly having to, to push back and battle with that um, when you may not necessarily be in a position uh, of power to, um, to reject um, those images and stereotyping because you need a job or um, you know, acting is your passion, for example, I'm, I'm just using that as an example. So there are many manifestations of racism in the art. Um, and anti-racism, which we'll talk about a little bit later, really is reflecting on these ways that racism occurs and doing specific things to counter these expressions and these manifestations of racism. We accept, we understand that racism exists. Um, so anti-racism means actively countering countering it. Um, and so connected to cultural appropriation, um, again, this textbook, um, The Color of Democracy, uh, talks about um, two processes of cultural appropriation and, and what goes into that. And so the first process that they, they suggest or they offer in the textbook is to say, you know, we have a, a white artist who interprets some sort of minority experience. So they create the product, they package it, they give it sentimentalization to where it will be able to um, have mass appeal. Um, and then after, once it takes on that mass appeal, mass appeal likes it, um, then there is like success, whatever success means, most likely uh, related to, you know, a lot of people attending or maybe like um, fame or, or, or fortune. The other process, um, and, and so that, if we're talking about cultural appropriation, it's really important to think about an aspect of racism um, called cultural racism. Now, there, there are many aspects to racism, and, and cultural racism is just one of them. Um, and it is important to consider this framework of interpretation and meaning for racial thought in society, because cultural racism is, is something that's so ingrained in the symbolic systems of society that it is almost always denied. Um, and it is seamlessly woven into the collective beliefs and value system of the dominant group. So white culture is sort of, if we, if th if we think about it in this way, white culture is sort of an invisible veil that envelops Canadians. Um, we, we, we are Canadian, we don't see our whiteness, we don't talk about it because this is, this is the norm, this is the way things are supposed to operate. And that is what cultural racism is. These are the unwritten rules that people follow in society. So in the arts, cultural racism marginalizes the cultures of others. And so the dominant group's cultural images, symbols, and norms remain intact. Right again, like that's what art does. It, it, it propagates images and symbols and norms um, in in an, in an effort to keep that narrative intact. In fact, I would argue that it is um, placed in opposition. Whiteness is placed in opposition to blackness to validate its superiority uh, and therefore keeping those cultural images, symbols, and norms intact. Simultaneously, creative expressions developed by racialized artists. Are appropriated. So their stories, their histories, and images derived from other cultures are interpreted and incorporated by white visual artists, curators, the theatrical producers, musicians, and writers into their own creations. And so we see the second process uh, of what how cultural appropriation is going to happen. We, we see the, the racialized artist or um, the marginalized artist, um, depending on what their identity is, is creates work. Um, there is a rejection by the mainstream because it doesn't fit that narrative. It doesn't, it, it seems to be too, too radical. Uh, people say this a lot about many things. It's just too radical. Um, and then therefore the artist experiences a marginalization. Um, the work experiences a mar marginalization. Maybe some time passes and there is a discovery by a white artist, a, a white producer, etc. cetera. Um, and they say, hey, you know what? This is really cool. Let's see if like, let me help you or let me, I don't, I don't know what the conversation is, but there's, there's a, a process of discovery. Um, and so then it goes back into this packaging. Okay, let's let's make this um, palatable. Maybe let's change a few of these things here. Um, as 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 a, a white person who doesn't maybe necessarily have the insight that you have, uh, I think that it would read better 
um, it would be consumed better in this way and then it achieves mass appeal and then again we're at we're at success um, and so <clears throat> the issue of appropriation really is that it's rooted in the problem of access and so in the exercise that I asked you to do uh, about 15 minutes ago um, is is I asked you to think about who, how are people accessing your work? Um, and, and so, and that is really, really important because historically black people, indigenous people, um, people who live or who are on the fringes of society have, have, have not had access to many of the institutions in Canada. Um, and for example, like, like wealth. So if you can think, uh, I'm just quickly pop in the chat, if you can think of any examples of cultural appropriation and think and, and really explore those examples for yourself and, and think about what exactly makes it appropriation um, and just share the types and I'll, I'll read them out as they come in. Um, but also thinking about like one, one, um, one, one example that comes to mind for me is, is Elvis Presley um, around the idea of cultural appropriation. Now, his story or his craft, his art is often and it will always be more complex than that, where there have been um, historically a lot of Black artists, musicians who've said that if it weren't for Elvis, they wouldn't have had the platform um, that they that they eventually got. Um, and so we go back to this idea about this discovery about the white artist, right? Uh, and what level of whitewashing needs to happen um, to be able to achieve that mass appeal. And so even when we, 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 we put the system of capitalism on top of um, other systems of oppression, we really start to struggle with um, the tensions um, and the, again, that pull back into um, centering whiteness uh, and, and that system, that, that society that we live in being quite resilient in keeping things in the way um, that, they sh that they should be to prioritize those parts. Um, and so I have someone mentioned, um, Tracy mentioned indigenous attire at festivals. Yeah, so that's a form of cultural appropriation, taking it and, and just, you know, wearing it for the fun of it um, and not, um, and not um, considering the cultural um, elements to it. Um, Leah says a non-signing person using sign language on stage performing a song. Uh, they use it for likes while not socializing with the deaf community or having a full understanding of the language exactly. Um, and, and like using it as a prop. Um, that's a big part of cultural appropriation, trying to, you know, uh, um, present yourself in a way uh, um, that that takes from um, that takes and, and diminishes even um, uh, communities that are that are typically um, marginalized because of the type of society that we live in, because of the structures. Oh, got some more points here just quickly. Um, yep, Kardashian spending a fortune trying to look like a light-skinned black woman. Holmes said this, yes, 100%, the Kardashians are constantly under fire. And even we could take it to another level where uh, the Kardashians now have, and the Kardashian Jenners, I guess, now have like black children um, um, where they may or may not feel that there is a certain legitimization of them taking from black culture culture but uh, and profiting from it um that feels very very icky um and a part a, a big part of of the conversation around appropriation is the fact that um um you know it's one thing to try on <laughs> try on um blackness um, but it is another thing to actually live through and have to face um, face anti-Black sentiments uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and watch your children face anti-Black sentiments on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and as I said, when I started this, like for me as a Black person, 
even the days that I just want to blend into the background, um, particularly in Kingston, because there are so few Black people um, in comparison to uh, the, the full, the larger population, um, that I, I can't take off my Blackness. I can't put it away for even five minutes. Um, we have, uh, sorry, just trying to get, uh, we have Jane who's mentioned um, for circus, circus is traced to forces in Britain, but almost all disciplines originated elsewhere. For example, uh, oops, I lost it, sorry. Uh, for example, Jane does cord de lis, um, but uh, malakam, I think is how it's pronounced, malakamb rope gymnastic in India is way older. Um, and I only know about it because of white artists who study the discipline. Um, the indigenous, uh, Tiffany Warden says the indigenous hoop dance act in Cirque du Soleil, um, sh um, show totem. Yep. Um, and so this idea is of just like putting in these cultural aspects um, and, and performances to liven up or to exotify or, you know, to provide some sort of um, entry point into, um, into uh, the, the, the cultures or the practices that, that, that don't really belong with us, but we can, again, like consume it um, and take from it from what we need. Um, we have lots of others, I'll come back to them. Um, I, I do see one I, that I've just seen from Kemi King about different forms of digital blackface, not just as influencers, but also rappers like 69 who use black styles and the N-word in their music. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one and it's emerging um, because of the technological advances um, and seeing, again, going back to the minstrels, like if we look at the legacies of this, minstrel as a form of art, um, as a form of art um, came um, about because came about because white people, white men, were painting their face their faces black, and so what does that mean to be to quickly or easily be able to put on a filter, um, um, uh, propagate stere stereotypes, or say really raci racially harmful things, um, and then. Uh, um, and then, you know, go about your business and, and not have to deal with the consequences of that. So cultural appropriation is a huge, um, a huge part of um, the discussion around anti-oppression. Anti um, and there are uh, parts of cultural appropriation where there's conversations around, so what do we, what do we talk about cultural exchange? Um, and to get into that conversation, that, that's a whole other part. Um, what we're thinking, what, what, what we need to start at is the definition of culture. Culture um, for most people is thought of as um, quite being quite static, being traditional, being, um, you know, um, cultural costumes and, and foods and so on and so forth. Uh, but culture also is really about like, again, what we normalize, what, how do you brush your teeth? That's a part of your culture. Uh, the things that we don't think about. Um, and so um, cultures aren't static either. And so that, that conversation um, really grows in, 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 in size when you, when you enter that that realm. Um, but for right now, we're, we're talking about in terms of cultural appropriation, we're thinking about access, we're thinking about the commodification, and we're thinking about the way that capitalism is used to uh, constrain and, and to exploit, um, exploit um, certain groups of, of people. And so moving on to um, talking about decision making in the arts. Um, and again, thinking back to that um, exercise of, of, of creating art as a resistance. Um, what's really important in decision-making is, you know, giving the appropriate time and consideration to research what it is that you wanna do and then doing it. And, and part of, of that consideration is asking the hard questions, um, which hopefully in your, while you were going through 
that exercise, you were doing that. You were asking who is represented, who is misrepresented in this space. That's a huge thing as well. Sometimes people are repre are represented in 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 are are represented but are being misrepresented at the same time. Um, what is the impact? Uh, that your art will be having. Um, all, all actions have a reaction. So there was definitely a type of impact. And that's the impact counts more than what the intent is. Um, how does this subvert the norm? Um, again, how are we being transformative in the messaging in, in what we're in the work that we're putting out there? Is the casting tokenizing? Um, do we prioritize anti-oppressive approaches to creating um, and have a strategy to follow? That's really, really important. Um, the struggles over the issue of representation are central to all forms of cultural production. Representation does not only concern the inclusion or the omission of in images of racialized people in art, but also who controls the production, the transmission of ideas, images, discourse in art and society. So again, this idea about like, it's not just who's in front of the camera, but also who's behind it. So we have to seriously in decision making seriously consider what an anti oppressive environment looks like. And maybe you're having conversations with people who are part of your team and you're having those conversations often, not just when there is an issue that has a that has a arisen. Um, so your task really um, once you leave this, uh, this session is to go back to your five minute idea um, and ask those hard questions of your five minute idea. Um, and if you want to grow that idea, it's, it's really important to make explicit goals to counter racism, to counter sexism, to counter ableism, to counter um, um, homophobia, for example. Um, it, is, it is really important to make those explicit goals. Um, you could also cluster hire or cluster casting. Um, that could be something that reduces the potential to tokenize. And so I've said tokenize twice now. And just to give a, a brief insight into what that is, tokenize, tokenization essentially is covert racism. Um, and so it's where those in power maintain their privilege by exercising social and economic and or political power uh, and muscle against the Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Tokenism achieves exactly the same thing while giving those in power um, the appearance of being non-racist um, and even champions of diversity because they recruit and use BIPOC people as racialized props. Um, and so this idea of performing, this, is, this, this performance of anti-oppression or this performance of non-racism. Um, and so non-racism and anti-racism, there's also a distinction there. Um, anti-racism or anti-oppression, as I said in, uh, previously, is that it is the, the active countering of the systems that exist. Non-racism is kind of like letting it just happen, but just not participating in it, being complicit um, and not not take not doing your part to uh, dismantle it. Um, it is important uh, in decision making to create a strategy or a plan to keep the guessing work out of it. Um, we should not be guessing <laughs> whether or not, um, you know, this could be racist or sexist or whatnot. Um, we if we create a strategy or a plan, we can refer back to that. And then also hopefully we're not constantly using the labor, um, the emotional labor, emotionally taxing um, people who are part of these communities to keep reassuring you that you're doing a good thing. <laughs> um, so remember, we're replacing behaviors and attitudes that are normalized within ourselves too. And so if we can create a strategy or a plan, we can, we can go back to it, we can update it, we can grow from it. Um, this strategy and plan also help, helps keep us accountable to ourselves, but also to the public. Um, we know that strategies build and evolve just as you would as well. And so it helps in the decision making. Um, and so a big thing comes up here is like, okay, but I'm really nervous about making a mistake. Um, well, what I wanna say is that we won't always be perfect. Um, again, we live in a very particular society um, and we are indoctrinated by these messages from birth 
until the point that we are now. Um, and so um, it is important for you to think about that a mistake might is, is probably inevitable. Um, and what you want to be thinking and including in your plan is how do you respond to that and how do you move forward and plan for that. And so that will help reduce feelings of defensiveness or responding defensively um, because ideally your back won't be against the wall where you're feeling you need to react. Uh, you've planned for this um, and you are open to growing and learning some more. Okay. And so how do we then build these anti-racist practices into our environments? Um, how do we build that strategy? How do we build that plan? Um, you know, it's about understanding the work. So learning about how your art sector um, organization participates in the marginalization of BIPOC artists, of other marginalized groups. Um, it's really important to do that learning and build that awareness. And again, part of that learning is learning about what society what type of society do we live in? And hopefully by the end of this, this session, you will be able to recall that long list of all of the, the, the type of, of the structure of our, of our society. It's really important to be conscious to that. Otherwise, we're, you, will, you will inevitably miss um, the, the subtleties um, that go on constantly around and that we also engage in that prop up um, the structure of our society. Um, it also means doing the work internally um, and being mindful of how Eurocentric values, aesthetic or otherwise, impose burdens and barriers and work to reduce those burdens and barriers for people around you. Um, it's, it's one thing you do it, but you do it within yourself, um, but also recognizing how you're complicit in it. It's not enough to not do anything at all or just say, you know, I don't say racist things or I don't do, um, I don't assume um, racial stereotypes of, of individuals or I, um, it, it is really important to take that work that you're doing internally, asking those hard questions of yourself and doing that work externally in the society around you. And so that could look like providing access or helping provide access to BIPOC artists, um, um, working to support, empower BIPOC artists to increase representation um, and responding to misrepresentation as well and correcting that. Um, it's also doing what's asked of you. Um, and one of the things that you can do that is being asked of people everywhere is that, you know, be vocal against racist practices and attitudes, whether they are individual, whether it's an interpersonal interaction that you're seeing, whether they're systemic, I should say systemic, not systemical, um, or whether they are cultural, which are sometimes harder um, to, to, to see. And so if you are doing that work, understanding, trying to understand the work, if you are trying to do that work internally, presumably you're, you're picking up on how culturally racism is a thing, how culturally ableism is a thing, um, how our world is set up around us to confer um, particular benefits to people who are able to, to fit into that structure perfectly. Um, it's also important to intervene where necessary um, and have the conversations with your community. Um, I can't tell you how important, particularly in anti-racism, it is for white people to talk to white people about racism. Um, there is a level of um, not just emotional labor, but also violence that um, that racialized people, black people, indigenous people face in being forced or um, being expected to teach white people about racism or about how their actions, whether that be um, subconsciously or unconsciously enacted um, as, as, as really um, damaging um, and upsetting to, to an in individual. Um, that's not saying that you can't have conversations with racialized people about racism, but also recognizing that if you're doing that learning, 
if you're taking it upon yourself to do that work internally, part of the work externally is calling is like is is like calling your people in um, and, and 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 rounding them up and telling them what's what and 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 how to move forward and how to do better. Um, so there's a lot of more learning. There's so much to learn, to unlearn, to relearn. Um, and so what I want to say to you is don't stop here. Keep going. Um, I've, I've included a few um, points here of things that you could do um, if you wanted to Google them quickly. Um, remember, it, it is not, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, we can't be complacent. Um, so we have to put in the work to get there. Um, and, and so some of these modules can help help you um, in, in that um, un, in, in terms of understanding the work, in, in terms of understanding the society that we live in, the structures that we live in. That's a really important thing to do. That was a really important for, thing for me to do, um, to understand the way, how, how exactly it is that racism functions. And because I have a, a bit better uh, understanding of that, um, I see, I'm able to see things a little bit more clearly. Um, there is a workbook called Me and White Supremacy um, by Leila Saad, um, and that is a really uh, a good one that you can purchase at any bookstore, um, and it, it's, it gives you a daily journaling um, and walks you through uh, white supremacy. I, I think it would be really important to diversify your news, um, and so I really like the web page Gyaldam. Um, um, as it's written on the screen, that's really important. Um, I've, you, I've greatly depended on the color of democracy, racism in Canadian society uh, textbook uh, to help me construct this this um, presentation. So I would definitely um, encourage you to, to check that one out, see if you can get it from the library. Um, and there is a free um, e-module on racism on the Ontario and Human Rights Commission's website. It's called Call It Out. So if you Google Call It Out OHRC, you should be able to, um, to find it. Um, and so that brings me to the end of the presentation. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, remaining or a little bit longer than that. Uh, I want to thank you for listening attentively, or I presume you are listening attentively. Um, and, you know, just keep in mind that this is an entry point into the conversation, the conversation that has been going on for a very, very long time. And so I want to encourage everyone who is watching this to, to keep going, keep on going. Um, don't stop, particularly don't stop when it gets hard either. Thank you. Ah, one, okay. Thank you so much, Lavi. I um, am so grateful for the lens you were able to bring and um, especially, well, we had a few questions actually, and I was really curious about cluster casting. If you wanted to speak a bit more about that, Murdoch asked a question. Could you sure. mind clarifying? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so cluster casting is something that I've kind of just, um, I, I'm kind of borrowing the, the concept from cluster hiring. Um, and so in organizational, uh, in, in organizations like in like universities, um, the idea, often we get calls for, we need more indigenous uh, professors, we need more indigenous staff or more um, racialized staff. Um, and what we, what we see happening is, um, basically one individual would be hired, for example. Uh, and then they are the sole person who inhabits all of that identity and are um, kind of on the fringes of their cultural environment. Um, and so their management doesn't understand them, their colleagues don't understand them or don't, or at least aren't able to be empathetic about um, how they are experiencing uh, the structures as they are within the organization. Um, and so what happens is eventually that individual, and sometimes it could be a couple of individuals, they'll get burnt out because they don't have the informal support networks um, necessary to, to, to persevere. Um, 
um, and, and feel like there is space for them to be themselves and to be successful in, in, that, in that organization. And so extending that to the arts world, I'm thinking about you know, that tokenized actor or whomever uh, being the only one um, and you know, again, experiencing those daily um, experiences of, of racism, cultural racism, um, and not having anyone who can relate uh, can be a really um, difficult, um, a difficult thing. So what some institutions and, and organizations have done is decided to hire three or four or five people who have similar identities and work on similar um, um, projects or, or work uh, areas of expertise, they hire them all at once so that naturally there will already be um, a network of informal support um, that is created uh, once these individuals join the, the organization. Awesome, thank you. And I invite people if they'd like to turn back uh, their videos back on for the questions. And um, especially if you have a question, please do turn your video on. We have one from, from Greg earlier. He wrote, I believe old time fiddle music popular locally may sometimes include music from the minstrel era. Is there an appropriate way for white people, for example, to engage with this music? Um, should they be open and transparent about its racist history or should it be left alone by certain musicians? Well, I would say explore it uh, in terms of go and read about it, <laughs> go and figure out what exactly are those connections. And so if that does come up um, and inevitably, if, if that is, if, there, if there, those connections are there, um, people will want to know um, and also recognize that for um, certain people who are aware of the history, who hold uh, heritage, black heritage, African heritage, uh, may choose to disengage from that art form or, or um, performance um, and, you know, just trying to recognize, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Um, what value does it have? Um, yeah, and being quite transparent about that. Did you want me to read out some of the other questions, Lavi? Sure, yeah, I, I'm okay. not sure who they are, yeah. So we've got uh, a, a lot of thank you, especially for your research and putting together this presentation from Josh. And I saw, oh yeah, do you have social media that people can connect to? I do, I'm not very active on social media and I think that that's, I, I'm trying to say that that's a very intentional thing, uh, but uh, I have Instagram, which is um, it's it's at horrid hen hen. I'll write it in the um, I'll write it in the the box. Um, and Greg said, "Thanks for answering my question, Lavi." So I think Carmel has a question from Leah, or no? She okay. was just asking, what is the handle? And you put it there. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time. I just want to um, reaffirm when you talked about intervention. I was at a, a workshop that turned into an anti-Black racism intervention. And what I learned is the main takeaway was to step up when I see something happening. I come from an idea of, oh, it's not my place. And, uh, you know, I should let people speak for themselves. And that's like, I that was the, the total, it was such a good takeaway uh, to be freed from that conception that I should let other people, because it's the exact opposite. Yeah, That's what we're, I, I can make a mistake, right? Like I should, if it, maybe they don't want me to, but it's, it's time for me to, to take a risk. Of making a mistake yeah you know, yeah 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 yeah, uh, uh, yeah. so the, the, like i mean and so there's a lot of um there's a website oh no i'm not gonna remember it now maybe i'll share it with you tracy but um that talks about like bystanderism i think i don't like that term because it kind of lulls people into this state of like inaction and say like well it's part of psychology so it's okay that i do this um and like it's it's, a, it's about intervening yes i think that there is a level where you need to be cognizant about the other person are you creating an issue that it's going to blow back on that person and become unsafe for them but also for yourself as well um but i think that it's all it, it is it is if it's something that is a red flag for you it it, it 
doesn't seem to be appropriate, um, you can put that out there. You can say, you know, for me, whatever is happening right here is it shouldn't it shouldn't be happening. Um, and then that kind of hopefully deflects from the, that individual who might be experiencing the harassment or the discrimination or the group of people um, and, you know, effectively um, draws that person into realizing whatever it is that they're doing is, 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 is not appropriate. Right. Uh, it looks like Murdoch has a question. Murdoch, did you want to ask, did you want to turn on your mic or <laughs> I can... Sure. I was trying okay. to type it out and then uh, I'm not so great with the chat. Anyways, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm trying to form it, but I'm also just trying to be brave and ask it, um, which is I, I have a question about um, uh, boards. And in Canada, you can't be paid to sit on a board. And I have a really hard time like I run a very small organization. We can pay people and when, when like as we're going through our staff, we're like trying to be like, okay, who, who is it we're gonna pay? But I have such a hard time asking um, um, people of color and, and people who are marginalized to be on our board because I'm asking for their labor. And I don't know how to rectify like that and also wanting to ensure that the leadership of a board actually is like diverse and doing the, all the things I want it to do. So I have yeah. a really, I struggle and I, yeah. And I think that that's, I mean, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the, the legislation or I didn't know that legally people can't be paid to be on boards. And I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense. Um, I think, and I see Holmes has, a, has her hand up. So maybe she wants to jump in at, um, now. Uh, yeah, so this kind of ties into my question that I actually uh, posted before Murdoch, um, which was oh, sorry. regarding the payment. Um, yeah because uh sorry where did i type here Ugh, i got lost um because like whilst the, i'm seeing like a lot of thank yous and a lot of like you know this is great but like are you being compensated like right now for like what you're doing and I am. moving forward like again like murdoch said like a lot of this work is free it's yeah. undervalued it is not paid for the boards especially young queens usually have these boards which are volunteer positions which are held by marginalized people who do not affect change who are yeah. on the low end of the spectrum we have people who are not calling out their higher ups we have staff and such who are not saying anything um i want to ask like as a person of color how do i like a little bit of a flip from what um murdoch is asking um, which is how do I advocate for myself? How do I make sure that I get paid for this work? This work is valued. If it is truly valued, if we are all truly equal, then we should be paid for equal work and moving forward, how do we change that? Also, um, in terms of addressing biases, uh, I do have to say, Tracy, I'm just, I'm not French, I'm just black. Sorry. <laughs> I am French, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, Holm, thank you, and, and Murdoch, thank you for your, your questions. I think, um, you know, the, the compensation is a big thing, um, and uh, particularly in, at Queens, in my experience, um, I don't know if it's because there's this uh, impression that most people who go to Queens, for example, are very well off and therefore they can do a lot of free work <laughs> for the institution or for it in, in the community. Um, and I think exactly what you just said is, is, you know, articulating that and saying, you know, I think that this is really important and it sounds like you are placing a particular importance on this. And so, Unfortunately for me, I am unable to help you in that capacity if my if I'm not compensated appropriately because I I like this is labor, this is time, this is you know um, beyond like the the like capitalistic production of of labor. Um, you know this is emotional labor. This takes a lot um, to to come here and do this, um, and so I think for me the question around, am I compensated just in general <laughs> well for the work that I do? I mean, it's fantastic. It's fabulous uh, that I, um, I mean, I guess that's a weird way of putting it, but like, it's, it's great that like my full-time job is dedicated to focusing on that. Could I be paid more? 
Yes, <laughs> um, um, but at the same time, I, 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 am, I am very cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of people in other disciplines who do other things for their full-time jobs who are also then just expected to apply their lens for an institution or organization or what have you. Um, and so connecting that to the board positions, um, I think that um, it's going to be very individual. There's a lot of things that I do that I take my time to do for free. Um, and I do that out of personal choice um, and agency to do that. And so I think that, you know, expressing yourself and saying like, I would like you to be a part of my board. Um, I can't compensate you formally in this way. Maybe there's a way like, you know, try and work out what works best for that person, I think, because I think if we kind of just get stuck at, well, I can't compensate them, so I'm not going to try and, and get that representation there, um, you, yeah, it would just kind of, it will fall flat, then, then you'll never have that representation. And so, yeah, it, it is a complicated one. And then on, as an aside, I think as, 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 as Black people, as people who are part of marginalized groups, you know, I would encourage creating our own um, as much as possible. Um, and, you know, starting from a place of complete agency. And I understand that that's not always possible. <laughs> um, but can, can we envision that? Uh, so we're not completely beholden by the, the structures that exist to oppress us. Thank you so much, Lavi. Um, I will take um, the notes from the chat so that we can share some of the resources that were shared here. Elizabeth had a question, but Carmel has to go. We can yeah. follow up uh, about the question, make sure it gets answered. Um, thank you so much, Lavi and Carmel. That was a, a lot of translating and I'm really grateful that, that uh, Labby's words were translated so well, so thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm looking forward to following up with a lot of the resources and continuing this work. Um, yeah, take care everyone. <laughs>